So the summer I turned 13 years old, my younger brother, Joe, who's about two years younger than me, and I uh, got into making model airplanes, World War II level model airplanes. How many of you guys did that back when you were kids? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. We made 13 or 14 of them and just at the end of one summer. Uh, I can't really tell you why we started and why we started doing that instead of playing baseball all day, which we usually did, but we did. Uh, we had flying tigers and Mustangs and B-52s. It was, it was pretty cool. But like most boys, my brother and I also had a fascination with, with firecrackers. See, we had this small stash of little red firecrackers. Uh, my dad had let us buy a few packs when we were on a trip to Florida. Back in those days, I remember uh, South Carolina was one of the only states you could buy them legally. So we bought a couple of packs of firecrackers. They, they were just dying to be used because I believe deep inside the soul of every male, there's a little pyromaniac waiting to come out. Am I right? Uh, so we were only supposed to use them when our father was supervising us. But toward the end of that summer, we just got an awesome idea. We'd gotten a little tired of the, of the model planes just sitting on the shelves in our room. You know, they didn't fly or anything. They just sat there. Uh, and our idea was to combine our firecrackers with our model airplanes. Any of you guys do that ever? Uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about? Right? So uh, we were going to attach them all, and then when our dad came home, we'd go light them and, and blow them up, and we'd be cool. We thought he'd think it was an awesome idea, too. Right? He's a guy. We had a problem, though. How were we going to stick the firecrackers to the airplane? We couldn't find any scotch tape for some reason. We were all out of airplane glue. Uh, and then we were digging around in a drawer. We found some of my mom's half-burned old dinner candles. And we got an idea. We were going to use the, the hot wax from the dinner candles to drop on the airplane, stick the firecrackers in there. Voila, right? So we got everything together. We got a, a card table in my room, uh, got, the, got the airplanes, and got the firecrackers, and lit the candle. Anybody see a problem yet with this? Okay. And I haven't mentioned yet that we had a little brother, too. His name was John. He was two years old at that time. And he was always, always curious about what we were doing. So we didn't even notice. We were so engrossed in our work, we didn't even notice when he came wandering into our room to see what was up. Nor did we notice when he reached up and grabbed one of the little firecrackers and held it into the open flame of a candle. The last service made that same sound <laughs> right there. All you moms out there, right? I did, however, notice the sound of a burning fuse. And I'm looking around, and I see it in his hand. My two-year-old little brother has a lit firecracker in his fingers. I reached down instinctively, grabbed it out of his hand, just in time for the blow-up in my hand. Boom! And he starts screaming. My hand is on fire. He's screaming. Little did I know, at that very moment, our father came home from work and had just walked in the house. The first thing he hears is... Boom! And our littlest brother screaming bloody murder. The next thing I knew, my father standing in the doorway of our room surveying. And he was not happy. I'm going to finish that story in just a minute, all right? We are now in a series called, a whole year theme called The Story of God. And we've been digging into the great books of Genesis and Exodus as we see the beginning of how everything took place. And we're in a series right now called Paradise Lost. And today we're going to look at one of the most well-known, famous stories in the entire Bible. In fact, a story so spectacular that sometimes we can kind of miss the point. The story to, comes to us in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. We usually refer to it as the story of Noah and the ark, right? And since it's four chapters long, um, I'm only going to pull out parts of it to read for you, and then we're going to try to make sense of it for us today. So let's begin Genesis chapter 6. I'm in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Now I'm going to stop right there after just half of a verse, because last week, Pastor Sterling talked about the genealogy that's in Genesis 4 and 5, just the previous chapters. And remember, he talked about the generations connecting Adam to Noah. In particular, he talked about what's called the line of Cain, the descendants of Cain, and the line of Seth, the descendants of Seth, the first and third sons of Adam and Eve. And the line of Cain, we saw, uh, turned away from God over those generations. The line of Seth, the Bible says, cried out to the Lord, turned toward God. And then there were two names in the line of Seth that Sterling pointed out that were different. There was this man, Enoch, who walked with God and was no more, went straight to heaven. Oh, that's unusual. We should pay attention to that. He walked with God. God took him to heaven without dying. And then we saw Noah, who found favor with God. 
So even as sin is progressing, even as human life is getting more and more dark, we see these two points of light. We see that God is up to something. We see that God is making a way to restore the relationship that he once had with humanity. Let's continue. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. I'll pause there again. Sterling read last week a verse from earlier in chapter 6 that says this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then this, And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. It grieved him to his heart. One of the most significant lines in all of the Bible. Verse 13. And God said to Noah, I'm, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door on the ark of the ark in its side. Make it with a lower second and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life is under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. If you are reading your own Bible, you read it later, underline this and circle it, put a star next to it. It's significant. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. Then in verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And then if we read on, Genesis 7 gives us the entire flood story. Noah takes his family into the ark once it's finished. The fountains beneath the earth burst forth. It rains for 40 days and 40 nights. All life is destroyed. And then we see this summary later in chapter 7, and these verses are not on the screen, so listen to me. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. So there it is. What do we make of it? Where do we start? Well, I think we have to start with what I'm going to call today the result of the fall. The first thing we see is the result of the fall. Now, most of you know I've been on sabbatical for the last couple of months. Um, had some time away, some time to reflect. My wife and I spent part of that time on a bucket list trip to Europe. Uh, maybe you've seen our pictures on Facebook, but we had a great time. It was like living in a postcard for 15 days. Just an awesome time. We got to see all kinds of touristy things, too, and many of you have been to these places, but I just want to share some of our trip with you. For example, in Paris, we got to see the Arc de Triomphe. We also visited the Eiffel Tower. Aren't selfies fun? I have about 30 of these I could keep going, but unfortunately I got banned after that one from taking any more selfies. But we also took a day trip to the coast of Normandy. I wanted to do this. I am interested in history. This is a monument on Omaha Beach where many of you know on June 6, 1944, 156,000 Allied soldiers landed on a 50-mile stretch of beach on the coast of France, the, France, the largest amphibious invasion in military history. That's why today we still remember Veterans Day. The loss of human life, the cost in human life on that single day, D-Day alone, is difficult to even fathom. As we were reading in the museum and looking at the information, I knew some of these things, but it became more real. Over 10,000 Allied casualties in one day. Over the course of the whole invasion, about four weeks, 200,000 Allied casualties and over 53,000 dead. If you add to that, and in my mind I was adding to that other casualties, which I'll talk about in just a second, but standing there in that now peaceful beach, it was just hard to wrap your mind around what happened there so long ago. And then we went from there to the American Cemetery, and even though I knew what I was going to see, I had seen pictures, when I saw those crosses stretching as far as my eye could see, 9,387 gravestones, and even though I didn't know a single name on a single cross, I felt tears well up in my eyes. 
and a lump in my throat. And as I walked through over that sacred ground, I started reading the inscriptions on the crosses. Names, birth dates, death dates. And I started calculating the ages. So many young men, 19, 20, 21. The ages of my boys now. And then as I walked, I added to that the thought of those from Germany or Russia or Japan or China who died in that same conflict. Filipinos and Islanders. And I started to add to that all the other human wars throughout human history. And it's overwhelming and it compelled us, me to ask questions in my heart. Why? For what? What has gone so wrong with the human race? And it's a question we've been asking throughout this study of Genesis. Just a brief review of what Jeff and Sterling and Andrew have been sharing this fall. Genesis tells us that God created the heavens and the earth and it was good. That God created Adam and Eve in his image and it was very good. And then he gave them the garden, this perfect place. The beauty of his provision and his presence, everything that they needed. And the limit and love of the Creator who said, you can eat from any tree in the garden except that one. Don't eat from that one because if you eat of that one, you will surely die. We remember all that. First three chapters of Genesis. And then we see that temptation comes into the picture. The serpent says, did God really say? Oh, he didn't mean that. Then came sin and the curse. Adam and Eve hiding in shame from each other and from their God. Sin corrupts all God made as good. And then we get to the story of Cain and Abel, first generation. And Cain kills his brother in rage and jealousy and pride. And then the relentless progression of sin throughout the next couple of chapters, until we get here to chapter 6 in Genesis, we're still in the first six chapters of the whole story, and we read, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way in the earth. Human beings uniquely created in the image of God, created to live in perfect harmony with Him and with each other, but now corrupt and violent, destroying the image of God, destroying creation itself, creation no longer very good, the curse of sin destroying all God made as good. And by the way, the brokenness we've seen in our own culture in recent days did not start in this election cycle. It started in the book of Genesis. And here is the result of the fall. In his love, God grieves. It grieved him to his heart. And in his holiness, he said, enough. The result of the fall is the wrath of God. That's point two today, the wrath of God. Let's go back to my firecracker story just for a moment. I know you're dying to hear the end of that. With the sound of the exploding firecracker still ringing in my ears, with my fingers still numb, tingling, and burning from the thing that went off in my hand as the protector of my little brother, did my dad recognize that? No. <laughs> At least not right away. With all that going on, my dad is standing in the doorway surveying the work of our hands. Now, my dad's about 5'10". Now he's a little bit shorter because he's 83. But then he seemed like he's like 8 feet tall. It was terrifying. He's in the doorway of our room. And now my father is not an angry man. Some of you guys have met him. Some of you people have met him when he's visited. He's not an angry man. He's a wonderful guy. I can count on less than one hand the times in my whole life I've ever seen him really mad. This was one of them. <laughs> it was one of them. He took one look at the model airplanes, the firecrackers, the open flame on the candle, and our little brother who's still crying... And he bellowed, it's a great word, he didn't yell, he bellowed, how could you guys be so stupid? I'd never heard him yell before, my whole life. And I'd never heard him use the word stupid before. In fact, later my dad came back and apologized to us for using the word stupid, which tells you something about my dad, okay? But he was angry. Question, should he have been angry in that moment? Huh? You think so? Maybe. What if my dad had heard the explosion, heard my little brother screaming, and just walked into the kitchen, made a cup of coffee, and read the paper? Would I have wanted a dad like that? At the moment, I might have gone, well, <laughs> no. What if he had came up and looked at what we were doing and said, ah, whatever, blow a couple fingers off, not really a big deal, right? Of course not, because that's a father who doesn't care. I hope none of you have had that experience of having a father who doesn't care. 
I've met people who've grown up like that. And it's not a good way to grow up. Because that's a father who doesn't love. Now, we look at this story most often, and we call it the flood story, and it is. Or we call it the story of Noah and the ark, and it is. And we find ourselves fascinated with questions like, did the flood really happen? Was it historical? Was it sort of a legend? Was it global or was it local? Did the water really cover the whole earth? Or was the ark really big enough to have two of every kind of animal live inside it for that long? Did Noah have like really big shovels or something? Now, all these are important questions. Questions that theologians and scientists have debated for centuries. And I could spend time talking about evidence for a globalized and historical flood. How there are 200 different ancient cultures that have similar, very similar flood stories way back in their cultures. From all over the world, from Mesopotamia and the Epic of Gilgamesh, which I was supposed to read in college and maybe read Cliff Notes or something. For, for countries like our cultures like the Maasai people in Africa, for China, Korea, South America, even Native American cultures like the Hopi have flood stories in their culture. How do you explain that unless something actually happened at one time in human history? Or I could point to evidence of a localized sort of Middle Eastern level flood that between five and 7,000 years ago there was, a, there was archaeological evidence that there was a deluge between the Black Sea and the plains of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They can demonstrate it. Maybe it was more localized. But as interesting and as important as those questions are, they aren't the point of the story. You see, this is not the story primarily of a man named Noah. It's not primarily a story about a great flood or a big giant boat. This is the story of God. This is the story of the wrath of God. Paul confirms this in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, when he writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, I have to acknowledge that the whole notion of the wrath of God makes us nervous, if we're honest, makes us a little queasy. In fact, there are plenty who no longer teach or believe in a God who is capable of wrath. A God of wrath seems so politically incorrect. I mean, we don't want a God of wrath. We want a God who is infinitely tolerant, don't we? And that's because we misunderstand what wrath is. And we misunderstand who God is. See, wrath is not rage. Wrath is not even how we tend to think of anger. As human beings, our anger is most often, if we're honest, driven by selfishness. You know, I get angry when someone cuts me off in traffic. That's just selfishness. It slows me down. I don't like to be slowed down. We get angry when someone takes our parking spot or lets their dog leave a gift on our yard, which happened to me last week. We get angry when we don't get our way. That's just driven by selfishness primarily. But God's wrath is never selfish. God's wrath is driven by two things simultaneously, his holiness and his love. Back to my dad for a second. My father's anger, wrath, that day was both justified, right? We agree it was justified, and it was an expression of his love. Even at age 13, in that moment, I knew both those things were true. I knew where his wrath came from. And interestingly, I knew something else. I also knew his forgiveness, which did come, was also an expression of his love. You see, without understanding wrath, we cannot understand the grace of forgiveness. Without understanding the wrath of God, what grieves his heart, we cannot understand the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's say we, we understand. Let's say we get all that. There's still a question kind of swirling around in your mind, some of you anyway. But why this? Why destroy everything? I've had people ask me that. I've had people tell me that was the single biggest barrier to faith, was they could not come to terms with a God who could display wrath. And I don't know that I have a completely satisfactory answer, but I'll start with this. Whenever you go to read the Bible, whether you're in your book club or on your own, you have to read, the, you have to read part of it in light of the whole of it. That is, you have to be aware of the whole sweep of the story to understand a part of the story. So you have to know not just the beginning of the story, you have to also know where the story winds up to understand this part of the story. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think 
it's important to understand that the Bible tells us there's something worse than death. That sounds funny to say, doesn't it? Because from our human perspective, life is the most important thing, and death is the worst possible thing. But from God's perspective, there actually is something worse than death. And it's living apart from Him. Apart from His grace. Apart from His goodness. That's what this story is about. You see, wrath is the appropriate response to sin and evil in the world. And I think wrath is close to what I felt standing in that American cemetery looking at 9,000 crosses from young men I never knew or will never know until heaven, that is. Because it felt like a kind of it felt like a kind of angry sadness. Does that make sense? Have you ever felt that? Angry sadness? See, wrath is what you feel when you see a story in the news, which I read just this past week, of a teenage girl in India raped by her drunken father and then beaten with tree branches because the elders in her community said it was her fault. Wrath. A sad kind of anger. We feel wrath because we are created in the image of God. Wrath is our reaction to evil in the world around us because we're created in His image. Wrath is God's reaction to sin. The difference between our wrath and God's wrath is that God has chosen to turn His wrath into a covenant. And that's the third thing we see in this story is the covenant. Back to Genesis 6. For behold... God says, I will bring a, flood, bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. See, the story is about the wrath of God, but it's also about the covenant of God. Now, what's a covenant? We don't use that word so much anymore, but it means a kind of holy promise, a kind of unbreakable, unshakable promise. I did a wedding yesterday at the East Campus in the chapel. I have another one coming up this coming Saturday. And we often use the phrase holy marriage in a service, holy matrimony. It's what the certificate says, joined together in holy matrimony. What is it that makes that relationship holy? What is it that makes that relationship different from every other relationship going on on the face of the earth? It's a promise that's made. Vows made to each other before God. It's a promise. That promise is a covenant, an unshakable promise, an unbreakable promise of faithfulness. You see, Genesis is the beginning of everything, which we've talked about this fall. Beginning of creation, beginning of human life, the beginning of sin and evil. It's also the beginning of God's promise, His covenant. It's the beginning of the gospel. And we've seen it already in little snippets. We saw it in God's provision for Adam and Eve when he covered their nakedness with animal skins at the price of shed blood because without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. Remember that? That was an image of the shedding of blood that was coming for us. We saw it in the line of Seth when Enoch walked with God and God took him straight into heaven. We see it in Noah who found favor with God before he even pounded one nail. He found favor with God. That's the grace of God. It's a gift. And we see it here even in the great storm of God's wrath. God's covenant with Noah is the promise of salvation. As Sterling said last week, God's promise to us is that despite our sin, despite the progression of sin and evil in the world, despite humankind's propensity for pride, selfishness, hatred, violence, and war, despite the Holocaust, concentration camps, genocide, and D-Day, Despite racism and misogynism and hatred and a little girl raped by her drunken father, despite all of that, God promises to make a way. And we see a dramatic picture of that way in the ark. God says, I will make a way for you. But what does that way look like for us? Jump ahead to the New Testament. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans 8 what it looks like. He says, therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There it is. That's the gospel. That's the good news that we can be set free 
from sin and death. Now, many of us here in the room today, maybe most of us, have put our faith in Christ, His death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sin, so we have the great hope of eternal life. And if you haven't and you don't know that, the Bible says, confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart He rose from the dead and you will be saved. You can have that this morning. It's a gift. It's not earned. It's received as a gift. But still, even if we have that promise, even if we know that with certainty in our own hearts, we have a question. What's next? What about all the sin and pain and death we see around us in the world? All that's still here. When's God going to do something about that? Years ago when our sons were much, much younger, my wife and I would uh, split bedtime duties. Uh, Some of you teen guys have heard this story. I told it just recently there. But one of us would take bath time. And then the other would, we'd hand off, and the other would take sort of bedtime, uh, tucking in, doing the prayers, reading the stories, and stuff like that. And so one night it was her turn to do bath, and I was down in the family room doing something really important, like watching a playoff game. And so she'd take care of all the bath times for all four of them, and then she holl- comes out to our little balcony, hollers down to me, they're ready for you. And I said, tell them I'll be right there. It was a really good game. I kind of got sucked into it. I don't remember, overtime, whatever. And like 45 minutes later, she comes back out to the loft again. uh, Did you go say goodbye to the boys? Oh, I totally forgot. How can I do that? So I ran upstairs, fully expecting them to be totally asleep. But I knew the next morning they'd say, Dad, did you come up? And I could say, yeah, I came up, but you were asleep. Went to the older boys' room. Both of them sound asleep. Went to the younger boys' room. The youngest one is on the bottom bunk sound asleep. So I climbed up on, stepped up on his bed, looked into the top bunk where my five-year-old was, I thought, sleeping. I looked over into him in the darkness. He's wide awake, eyes wide open. When I looked at him, he looked back at me and said, I knew you'd come, Daddy. I knew you'd come. I almost missed that. But my five-year-old believed my promise. He believed my word was a promise. And so he waited in faith for that promise to be fulfilled. That's what Paul says in Romans 8 as we continue, verse 22. We know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Is that not true? Can we not see that from 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote that, it's still true today. The whole creation groans as in pains of childbirth right up till now. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even those of us who've received Christ as Lord and Savior, who have the eternal hope, we too groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as through sonship, the redemption of our bodies. He's talking about the end of the story there. He's talking about when Jesus comes again, when we receive our new spiritual bodies, new heaven, new earth. That's what he's talking about. And it's not here yet. And we groan. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The Bible, from front to back, is saying God has made a way. His promise is ours in Christ. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we have new hearts through the forgiveness of sin. We have new hope. We have new identities. We have new destiny. But the story's not finished yet. We wait for that final fulfillment. If I could tell you the story and map it out, the timeline, we have the beginning of all things. We have creation here. We have the creation of Adam and Eve here, and everything is very good. Then we have sin and the curse, and things are broken. And we have the wrath of God who judges, whose heart is grieved. And then we have the promise, I will make a way. And then Christ comes into the picture. And we today have the benefit of seeing his shed blood for us. And that's where we live today. And we are still waiting for the end of the story. When he wraps everything up in new heaven and new earth. But it's not here yet. All human history waits for that day. All of creation itself waits for that day. And we wait, groaning, crying out for that day. But we wait with hope. Because 
God has promised. We bow with me as I close in prayer. Lord, we're deeply aware that all of creation groans today. We're deeply aware something's wrong with the world we live in. Something's wrong even inside of us. We know that. So we thank you for your word, for teaching us through this ancient and strange story about your holiness and your love and your wrath. Thank you for making a way for your promise of salvation that we can know now in our hearts and that is still to come for all things. And may we wait in hope. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Eric. Just before I pronounce the benediction, just want to let you know there's no need to stack the chairs today. We have a church family meeting, which will start in just a few minutes. If you stay around, Pastor Jeff will be here and we'll lead that meeting. So leave your chairs where they are. Please receive today's benediction. Go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is in himself the promise of God. And may he be your hope today. Amen. Have a great day.